Good morning. <laughs> a very warm welcome, and I'm very impressed that you've managed to be here by 9.15 after all the festivities, no doubt, last night. So thank you very much and welcome. I'm sure it's going to be a good session. Um, yesterday, we looked at the kinds of issues that we need to consider following the referendum results. We have, in the past, as you know, worked very well on the devolution of power and money from central government down to our local authorities. And now we'll be looking at Europe, but we have two years, at least. Greg Clark, Greg Clark yesterday, I was really pleased to hear, did agree that we could have a front seat at the table on the negotiations. And as far as he was able, I'm sure he will be upholding that. So I, I, we have had considerable reassurance in that. Today, we're looking at something a bit different. Today, I'm really pleased to welcome Lord Victor Adebowale. And what we're looking at is what the referendum means for the landscape, the political landscape that we have. I wonder if the big parties who don't necessarily find themselves able to control members with a party whip as much as perhaps they used to, what does that mean for the political diversity in our countries today? So welcome, and we'd, I'd like to now go on to introduce Lord Victor Adebowale, and I'll just say a few words before <laughs> just about you so that people know where you're coming from. Um, Lord Victor Adebowale is one of our vice presidents from the independent group of the Local Government Association. He is an active crossbencher in the House of Lords since his appointment in 2001. Victor is chief executive of Turning Point, a health and social care social enterprise providing services for people with complex needs, including those affected by substance misuse, mental health, unemployment, housing issues, offending behavior, and learning disabilities. All of the issues that are very much in our remit. Turning Point, many of you will know, because they're engaged with over 25,000 people in over 200 locations across England, employing over 3,500 people and with a turnover of 125 million pounds. Victor has a passionate interest in public service reform and speaks on poverty, social, ex social exclusion, equality and human rights, diversity, leadership and change management. Victor and I served together on the Board of Governors at the University of Lincoln, where Victor is Chancellor of the University. He also has an MA in Advanced Organisational Consultation from the Tavistock Institute and is a formidable, has a formidable flair for managing organisations and working with indeed a number of organisations, University of Birmingham, University of Cambridge Business School and is on the Board of Governors of the London School of Economics. So a very broad and interesting CV which I'm sure has brought a great amount of skills and interest and I forgot to mention is also a non-executive director of NHS Link England which links with the next session after this. So thank you very much, Lord Victor. Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Um, with all that, all that CV <laughs> stuff, um, I still get the slot at 9.15. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You could at least give me one at half seven or something after I've had a couple of beers or a decent lunch. She said, come and speak at the LGA conference. I'd like Marion, I always say yes, because you, you can't say no to Marion. I say it, you, then, then I get told, it's 9.15, get to bed. And you're all here, which I'm deeply, deeply humbled by, to be honest. I think you've all come to hear Stephen Dorrell, um, not, not me. Anyway, I, I shall do my best. Oh, by the way, people um, get confused. They, they don't know the Lord Victor Adibuali bit, and it's got all the titles and all that up there. But I feel that I'm amongst friends and, and fellow um, journeymen, journeywomen, so you can all call me Professor Lord Victor Adibuali, CB. <laughs> 
No, Victor will do nicely. Victor will do. Ni it's all nonsense, really, isn't it? At the end of the day, the pe anybody who, people who call me uh, Lord usually want to sell me something. Do you know what I mean? And I'm not here to sell you anything. Um, I'm going to tell you. I'm, I've got to stimulate a debate, haven't I? I've got to stimulate a discussion. So um, I'm going to give you a view, which you may or may not agree with, but it's a view anyway, and um, hopefully we can have a chat about it. Um, I'm, I'm 54 years old, right? I know I don't look it. Yes, a mere child, uh, 54 years old. I've been in public services of one kind or another for about 30 years. I have worked in the private sector. I once got told to leave um, Dixon's because I was caught not selling a video recorder to my next door neighbor who I knew couldn't afford it. Um, and I was told to get off. And then I met Stanley Carnes actually in the House of Lords about 20, 30 years later. And I explained to him why I'd got sacked. And he said, you're absolutely right. <laughs> absolutely right, you know. Um, but he said, I'd never employ you again. <laughs> We're living, it's everybody, it's the cliche, isn't it? We are living through extraordinary times. It's difficult, it's this, it's that, or the other. All that's true. I'm not going to start by saying we're living in extraordinary times. You all know it. The country's, well, not much has divided this country uh, in recent memory um, to the extent that the, the EU referendum and the decision to leave has. I mean, uh, virtually every conversation I start with, it's kind of, it's, you're either trying to work out whether they were in or out, or you just come straight out with it. In, out. There's no shake it all about. It's just in, out. And, and you decide, people decide, they've, they've allocated presumption and assumption about what it means to be an inner and what it means to be an outer. That's what division in the country means. It means, it means assumption, presumption. It means labels. It means are you one thing or the other? Are you one thing or the other? Communities, friends, families, they've all voted in different ways. I know of husbands and wives that have voted differently. <laughs> Um, the divorce lawyers are going to be having a field day. Members of the same political party have voted differently. There was a brilliantly high turnout, 72%, the highest since 1992. And the decision by the Prime Minister to not apply the party whip shows what a personal election this was for many people. There have been countless explanations as to why people wanted in or out leading to a swing from 67.2% of people in 1975 wanting to join the EU to only 48.1% wanting to remain in 2016. Analysis after opinion, after polls, have tried to explain the eventual result. It comes down to age. Say some. 73% of under 25s voted to remain, while 60% of over 65s voted to leave. It's all about geography, say others. Three of the top five areas that voted to leave are in the east of England, while seven of the ten areas with the highest share of the vote for remain were in London. Over four million people have signed a petition asking for another referendum, and speculation about loopholes and ways to avoid the decision are rife immediately after the result. Why? Well, the PM didn't call the referendum expecting to lose. The city didn't expect to lose. Yet the divisions in the PM's own party, as well as, on, as well as in our local communities, have sent shockwaves across the country, leading to some would say chaotic manoeuvring from both the government and the official opposition. It's like watching the Foresight Saga, isn't it? Every day there's something different and we, we are involved in a political psychodrama, the likes of which, well, Michael Dobbs, Lord Dobbs now, said he couldn't make it up. Couldn't make it up. We've even had the SNP touting the idea that they should be the new official opposition, which I think would be sport. In short, what we have is a post-Brexit country in a political crisis. A crisis in part caused by a lack of engagement with local people. As a member of this independent group stated, the EU has been blamed for things which are actually the fault of bankers and successive governments. The scapegoating of immigrants is particularly worrying, end quote. 
A piece in the Financial Times stated that it was the working classes that voted for Brexit because they were economically disregarded. But it is why they who could suffer the most in the short term from the dearth of jobs and investment, it's they who would suffer the most in the short term from the dearth of jobs and investment. The article goes on to say that they have merely swapped one distant and unreachable elite for another. Many would agree that this election has divided communities, not on issues pertaining to the workings of the EU Parliament. I don't know about you, but I never read the Maastricht Agreement. Put your hands up if you did, because I will buy you a beer. You're on. <laughs> that's cheap, but you know, that's why I said it. This election has divided communities, and it's not about the workings of the EU Parliament or legal sovereignty, but rather on far more socio-economic concerns. Many have insinuated that those who voted for Brexit are economically ignorant or voted on grounds of immigration or race. My wife, I'll just tell you this, speaking to one of my neighbours, said, um, usual opening opener, in, out. <laughs> were you in, were you out? Now this guy is an ex-senior policeman, highly qualified, degree the lot. He said, I voted out. I voted out, I want to leave. And she said, why? I'm just curious. You know, this, we get on with this guy, you know, we, we, we've had drinks with him around his house, we know. He said, um, I'm sick of the, of the Islamification of my country. And my wife said, what's that got to do with Europe? What's that got to do with Europe? He went, well, I'm British. The fact that he's married to an Asian woman seemed to have escaped him. But you see my point. People voted for reasons that were not necessarily to do with economics or their understanding of the EU. The result has, unfortunately, given voice to racism. It's emboldening some to believe the EU result give their views not only a platform, but support. And this is unsurprising, although in no way condonable, given the divisive campaigning and many myths around immigration that ensues, that have ensued over the last few weeks. But I think the assertion that all Brexit voters are racists or don't get it is hugely unfair and vastly oversimplifies the issue. We need to defend the local as not ignorant or small-minded but consider, we need to consider the reasons for their positions and remember that the issues of those living in the east of England, for example, are very different to those of us living within the M25. Whether or not the decision to remove the party whip was good for the stability of mainstream politics might be questionable. However, what is clear is that the division seen in the government is mirrored in many towns, many communities, and politicians often whipped to a line wanted their voices to be heard just as the electorate did. Politics at its worst is disenfranchising. It's isolating when it should be engaging and educative. I know this, I give talks to sixth formers in schools and I stand there as a member of the House of Lords and I stand in front of young people who have no idea how the country's run. And my opening line is often, well, you know what, if you don't know how your country is run, your country will run you. And I'm not sure that that level of not knowing is confined to the young. I think many people in this room will be aware of people who simply don't know. They are disenfranchised. The world is no longer represented by in or out Conservative or Labour, Lib Dem or UKIP. We no longer live in an either or world. We live in an and and world. Campaigns that reduce issues of complexity to such simple choices, in my view, do citizens a disservice. 
The negative costs of the EU on immigration were widely reported, but this ignores the resurgence of areas like Boston Lincolnshire, for instance, which may look different to how they did decades ago, but have a more consistent, thriving economy because of immigration. Or indeed, the 5% of NHS workers from the EU, who we rely on. I've often been told by politicians, usually party politicians, that the job of a politician is to make life simple because it's not. My view is that the job of politics and the job of politicians is to introduce complexity to people's lives in a simple way. It's not just to represent the people they're elected to represent. It's about introducing that complexity. And yes, sometimes it's about challenging views from the point of respect and from the point of understanding of where people are at and where they want to go. The abolition of slavery introduced notions of morality to commerce, despite the fact it would have been cheaper and simpler to carry on with the slave trade. People had to be persuaded. So to the independents, so to you. I think the number of independents are growing because of the sense of distance from what politics means to people locally from that lack of relationship between the individual and the body politic, both locally and nationally. People want to relate, they want to be understood, and yes, they are willing to be led from where they are to where they haven't been yet by people who empathize with their lives and who are willing to listen and educate with them, not to them. We have a mission, and that mission doesn't require the permission of party loyalty. It requires the permission, respect, and dialogue with people. With that in mind, I do believe that the future of politics lies in more diversity. But the challenge will be how this diversity of thought, of background, of opinion, leads to united, cohesive communities fighting against the pressure to divide and the pressure to simply ask, are you in or are you out? Thank you very much. Well done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'd like to take some questions. We've got uh, 10 minutes, and so I'd like to see some hands up so that we can uh, send the boards around and uh, get some questions in. Um, I hope there's been some useful food for thought. Perhaps it's too early for questions. Thank you. <laughs> Number three? Yes. Hello. Um, Oh, hello. We had a chat last night. We did. <laughs> you've, been, you've been saving this question up, haven't you? God. <laughs> one of the things I think, you know, you, well, a lot of what you said there is spot on, but one of the problems I think that we're going to have with engaging with people and, and getting people willing to um, step up and become involved is the lack of power uh, councils and ha actually have over their own area. Now, if you get people involved and they want to do things for their community, and then they find that actually the council can't deliver, you're right back at square one. Mm -hmm. We've got to find a way of how central government and indeed the councils actually start listening and devolving power and responsibility to local communities. And if you don't get that in tandem, you'll end up with a lot of disappointed people. So I'm just wondering how you would square that. Well, I, I think that um, uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. I, I think that y there's two bits, really. I, I think we should be a bit more humble you know, most people I know don't want to get involved. They want to be, get engaged first um, before they get involved. You know, when you knock on somebody's door and you say to them, I want you to get involved in running your council. Well, my response is I'm paying a hell load of money for you to do it. Um, political involvement or political engagement is about understanding where people are, are at and where they want to go. And actually, it is educative. It's not just about accepting the view of people who may not know what you know. 
but how do you introduce that information into people's lives so that you can get into a useful relationship with them? I know, partly because of some of the work that Turning Point's done, that it is possible to engage people in the design and delivery of services that are very different from the ones that we do now. But you have to start by giving them some power. You have, well, you have to start by listening to them, actually. There are four rules of engagement. You have to listen to people. You have to um, really listen to people, <laughs> which is not easy. You have to um, get them to understand that the outcomes are in their remit. You have to design services that they understand. And you have to involve them in talking to their fellow um, citizens. You have to give them power. That's how you do it, in my view. Right, thank you. Um, I see Alan in front as well. I don't know where the... can't see the uh, sign there. Is number... Oh, over there, is it? Right, thank you. If you wouldn't mind just saying where your council, your name and your council as well, that would be really helpful. Thank you very much. Ron Tindall, Decorum. Hello, Ron. Hello, <laughs> Peter. Uh, just as a matter of interest, I, given that a proportion, and I'll say no more than a proportion of outers, were voting as much as against Whitehall as against the European Union. Would you consider that a real push on devolution to get powers away from and down at Whitehall and down to local authorities will be a help towards increasing democracy throughout the country? Uh, I'm all for devolution as long as it's not an abdication of responsibility. I think that's just <laughs> as far as I, I, I mean, I'm, there's nothing wrong with devolution. But we do have a national government, and I think that it's important that they're held accountable for the frame in which devolution takes place. I think it could be quite cynical, actually, to give people devolved powers and authorities, but actually not the resources or the wherewithal mm. to actually implement them. It, you're just passing down blame. So we need to be careful that we, that we have a, the correct frame within which we can deliver. Yeah, money and resources. Thank you. Number three could come down a bit, please. Thank you. Alan Selden. Thank you, Marion. Alan Selden from Herefordshire Council. I think you'd agree with me, Victor, that um, the, the vote a um, week ago, two weeks ago, it was a, a protest not only about Europe, but uh, a protest against remote government. And um, this, the situation we're in with the evolution is that, uh, OK, some stuff is coming down our way, but things like the health service and the education system seem to be being more centralised. Is there anything we can do through your good offices and the House of Lords to, to try and stop that centralisation agenda mm. that seems to be coming more from the civil service than our politicians? Mm, well, I'm not sure. People blame civil servants for things that actually are the fault of politicians at the end of the day. I don't think that civil servants have that much power, to be honest. I have a rule, actually, about my role in the House of Lords which is that I only speak where I think I can make a difference. I only vote on things I understand. So when people look down the voting record, they don't see me going through the lobby every day just to pick up. And I, I think there is an issue about um, telling truth to power, um, being really honest about the impact. Um, I think we're at the foothills of devolution, to be honest. I think that the vision, the notion of devolution is a very good one. I, can't, I, I, I don't see much wrong with it. But it's one of those things where we need to think long term and learn short, you know, we need to keep the learning going. And I think we need to burst some of the canards where people say things are devolved, but in fact, they're not. Um, and I think it's a real balance between setting national standards and giving local freedom. Um, because I want my kids to be as educated as well as, as well as any kids, as well as the kids in your area. And I don't want different choices that affect the future of my kids made. On the other hand, I want the, um, the, the demographic mix to be taken into account when constructing local educational policy, for instance. So I do think there's, there's a question of how we tell truth to power in a way that's clear, encourages learning on both sides, and actually creates um, an and-and and a can-do that makes a difference on the ground. Thank you. Number four, over there, please. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff Cairns, uh, Wayne from Borkham Council. If we were to look five years out from the events of the last few months. Do you anticipate that the bike paddock might be a much wider range or a more diverse range of political groupings than we currently have? Uh, it's possible. I mean, I'm not sure that it's necessarily... But, I mean, I think what I can see, and one of the good things that's, that's happened, I think, is that people 
in a way, whether it's... So I was speaking to someone on, on, at the weekend who voted out, and um, she said, well, I voted out. I never expected that we'd win. And I think you must have heard that from people. And I, I, I said to her, you know, what does that tell you? And she said, it's tell, it tells me that my vote counts. That actually, things can happen because I've voted. That I ought to be interested. I don't know what's going to happen next, she said. And she was quite worried about whether she'd made the right decision. But what we ended up agreeing is that she would never ignore politics again. So I think that it's the main parties will, I think, fight to remain cohesive because cohesion equals power. However, I think the country will start coalescing around different issues. Um, we need to be reminded that the banking crisis was a major blow. If you think Brexit was bad, the banking crisis was a major, major blow to this country's economic and political um, uh, body. And we've yet, I don't think, I don't think we've yet, I think we've yet to recover from the politics of that. So, yes, I think that some parties will benefit from um, the, the Brexit vote, but I think it's more likely that certain issues like poverty and the impact of poverty on all our lives will suddenly become something which actually we need to be interested in. You know, one of the reasons why people voted out when they were told by experts, economics, economists, that it would have an economic impact on the country was that, and some of them said this to me, they said, well, actually, I can't get, if I get a bit poorer, that's fine, <laughs> because I'm already poor. And I want some of those people in the South to experience the shock and uncertainty that I have to put up with every day. The future is decided by the things that we fail to discuss in this country properly. And I can see those things becoming more discussable. Poverty, race, it's just that I'm worried that the, that the discussion becomes polarized, that we have an either or discussion. You either like it or you don't, as opposed to an and and discussion. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, I'm less concerned about whether we have more political parties. I'm more concerned about whether we can discuss issues. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, number two there. Thank you very much. Yes. Hi. Um, Sandy Martin from Suffolk. Uh, Victor, you've probably been asked this quite a few times in your political career. And uh, <laughs> Political uh, career? I, I, I feel... <laughs> Well, I, I'm I haven't got one of those, mate. Getting into <laughs> here, talking, uh, asking you this question at an independent uh, group plenary, but um, you're a very persuasive person. You think? Oh, yeah, very much so. And, and uh, did it ever occur to you at any stage that you might be able to persuade more people if you were persuading them in an organised way within a political party? I am persuading them in an organised way. I mean, this is... What, what can be more organised than Bournemouth at 9.15 in the morning <laughs> with a bunch of people in a room who've managed to get up at the crack of dawn to come and listen to me grab it on? No, I, I'm, I think that politics surrounds us. Politics is life, pretty much. I'm not too good at um, uh, following orders that make no sense to me. And uh, power, this is going to sound a strange thing, but I think power weakens you as a human, oddly enough. I think it can become, well, the saying, power corrupts, ultimate power corrupts, you know. But I'd, I'd, I actually think that um, I'd much rather engage in the politics of life and encourage other people to do so. If I was to describe my own political position, and some of you may think this is terribly hippie-ish, but I'd say I was a practical idealist. I think that the things that make us human can be delivered, but we have to have confidence in our ability to deliver them. Um, you know, that's how we got rid of... That's how we stopped putting kids up chimneys. It's how we got rid of slavery. It's how we reduced welfare reform. It's because we considered ourselves human before we considered ourselves red or blue or yellow or purple. Sorry if that sounds a bit 1962, but you know, <laughs> that's who I am. That's what I believe. Okay. I think we're just drawing, is that number two there? We just take number two and that'll be it. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm really glad I came to this early morning discussion. Thanks. It's been, been really uh, interesting to hear. Um, you said you'd like to see more independent um, politicians. How are we going to support them against the party machines? 
I think that's a really good question. It was a, it was a conversation I was having um, as I walked into the hall. I think it's a really delicate thing to do. On the one hand, um, independents have to be grounded in the needs and understanding of the local community. Um, but you have to do so in a way that is ed educative. And I say that because, actually, you will, you will meet people who want to, you know, kick the blacks out or consider that, you know, you can do that something instantly. And you have to engage in a conversation which is educative. You can't just say, yes, I agree, because I want your vote. That's, that's what I... I don't think independents are about that. So there's a challenge to be educative and to be and-and in your discourse. That's one challenge. There's a challenge to remain free of entryists. And I think one of, the, one of the issues which I'm intrigued by is the growth of independence must be considered by some people who, who are members of the political, political parties, in the main stream political parties, as something of a threat. Because you guys can't be controlled. You're not whipped. You know? You're not particularly in it to um, get to number 10. You, don't, you can't be sort of, you're not that bothered about the sort of the, the trappings of power, I mean, I'm, you know. Mm. Um, so you're quite difficult to control, and that implies that you might be susceptible to a kind of entryist approach. <laughs> and I think there's two things that you need to do. The first is that you need to build networks. I think um, when I say, I say this because um, one of the things that I'm really clear about is that the politics of hierarchy is less important than the politics of networks. It's about the power of relationships, the power of actually coming together, challenging each other, and keeping each other true to the values of independence. Mm. However, having said that, you have to avoid becoming um, uh, a group that's, and this happens, I'm sure you've all experienced this, groups have a tendency to encourage, however subtly, group think. And that ceases then to be independent. So I think you have to tread a fine line. I think it's possible to do it, and I think it's possible to structure a place where independents can feel comfortable in supporting each other while being comfortable about the differences that you have between each other, learning together, and actually showing what people what politics is actually about. Thank you very, very much indeed. Those are really helpful questions and a huge thank you to Victor Adebowale for a terrific insight. And I, I always enjoy his humour and the real incisive comments that you get. So thank you very much indeed for that. So politics is life and there's, we, we're all independent in our thoughts. <laughs> so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you.